Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the 8 Stealth Beetle. A couple of months ago, I was stood in this very... You bastard! <laughs> so, I was going to say I was stood here and now the engine's working, but that's quite obvious. Yeah. Let's get on with the episode, I think. Okay, so the six litres of proud American muscle runs. And as most of you who are petrol heads know, this is one of Chevrolet's crate engines. Anyone can go to their website, browse the 27 different engine types, choose your level of spec and equipment, take out your credit card, and become the owner of up to 632 cubic inches of guaranteed exhilaration. There are LS, LT or LSX options, and a host of small block or big block engines. They literally arrive in a crate with an ECU, some cables and various bits and pieces ready to go. Chevrolet advertise their crate engines as connect and cruise, which might be fine for a Corvette or a Camaro engine swap, but what does that mean to us at V8 Stealth Beetle? Here is a conservative list of things Jean and the team have had to modify, refine, and in most cases out and out redesign and fabricate to get the Chevy Beast to work in the V8 Stealth Beetle. As the keen-eyed among you have already picked up, this is an LS2 engine. It has a capacity of 6 litres and not the LS3 with 6.2 litres. But I'm afraid this is what was readily available to us here at the tip of Africa. But it works perfectly well for the development of the chassis as it is the same physical size as its slightly more bored out brother. This means that for those of you who buy the chassis, it can fit the LS1, 2 or 3 engine, or in fact the Audi, if you want to stick with the German option. So immediately we had to turn the intake manifold around. We don't want that huge air intake sucking in gallons of air right next to the driver's ear. In turning the intake manifold, we then had to relocate the oil pressure sender, as there was no space for it. And then onto the main fundamental change. Every panel in the chassis and engine cradle had to be revised. The main revision being changing the rear firewall to accommodate the physically larger engine. We moved it forward about 4 inches or 10 centimeters at the top, while keeping all the legroom and cabin space intact. Here you see Bradley cutting holes strategically placed to give the owner access to various parts of the engine and running gear. These final revisions will of course be laser cut once we go into production. Not all changes are big. A subtle change in the lower cradle tubing allows you to change the oil filter without removing the engine, which I think is definitely a win all round. Smart move there, Jean. Next up was to redesign the engine mounts for the larger engine. This meant two of the mounts moved from the cradle to the actual aluminium box sections. Next is another biggie. Because Jean wants to continue to use the almost bulletproof, race-tested Getrag transaxle, a unique adapter plate was designed and then fabricated by Rage Motorsport in Johannesburg here in South Africa. And that is one sexy piece of aluminium. These plates will be available from us for those wanting to build their own slice of VW bug history. Jean also designed and had made a new flywheel and racing clutch from TTV Racing in the UK. This is another company with exceptional craftsmanship. If you're in the market for a racing clutch or flywheel, I suggest you check out their website. Finally, for this part of the engine, the new starter motor was sourced and fitted. Once the drivetrain was sorted, Jean turned his mind to cooling this baby. You see, the Chevy comes with this big, cumbersome water pump housing, which is fine if you have the hood the size of a Corvette to stick everything under. Remember, we've got a firewall in the way. And so, after much brain power, Jean designed and fabricated his own plumbing solution. The original water pump was ditched in favour of an electric one and relocated into one of the side boxes. While Jean was busy, Pierre set about the electrics. 
relocating various plugs, cables and sensors. With the ECU and loom now placed in front of the engine, the wiring to the injectors and coil packs all had to be rebuilt. Once that was done, the ECU also got the once over to make sure that everything opened and closed and fired when it should, and that everything still talked to everything else. Of course, a new exhaust system was designed and fabricated, which gave Bradley a chance to show off his welding skills as well as his funky socks. Wisely, we've used the original headers so that those of you who want to build your own car can use the OEM Chevrolet units with our exhaust pipes and silencers. Integrated into the system are CO plugs, which of course talk to the ECU. We also designed and fabricated our own air intake, which houses the mass airflow or MAF sensor. This is an important part of the electronic fuel system as it lets the ECU know how much air is entering the air intake. The new air filter finishes off this part of the engine nicely. Another important job was designing and fabricating the alternator bracket and its tensioners. Here we started with a paper template and progressed through to aluminium. And now we're down to the last few steps. And these are to supply high pressure fuel from the fuel tank, design and fit the water header tank, confirm the engine oil level, the water level and the fuel pressure, and swing the engine until the oil pressure is obtained. And only then can we do this. Well, that brings us to the end of what I think you'll agree. It's quite an interesting episode 25. You've seen the LS block as a paperweight. You've definitely seen and heard her running. What is left to do now is to weld the chassis and then drive her out the door. And no, we haven't forgotten about the vehicle going to the States. Coming soon, the final chapter in the Texas car.